Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Reeve Paul McLaughlin, President of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. The province of Alberta has been looking at changing how municipalities operate, run in elections, work under emergencies, and are funded with a trifecta of bills that have been released in the last month and a half. Bill 18, defending Alberta's provincial priorities, would require the federal government to work with the province to fund any municipal issues. Bill 20, the Municipal Statutes Amendment Act of 2024, would allow the province to amend or repeal any bylaw that the municipality passes if the province's province deems it not in the province's interest. It would also introduce political parties at the municipal level at two cities before expanding it to potentially all municipalities in the next, next election. And finally, just last week, Bill 21, the Emergency Statutes Amendment Act, if passed, the bill would give the province sweeping authority to seize control over local emergencies. So today we'll be discussing those three bills and the ramifications of the province municipal relations and also the state of rural municipal today in 2024. With that, Paul, welcome back to the show. Perfect. Thanks for having me. So, Paul, I want to start off with a sort of general overarching question for the three bills. Bill 18, Bill 20, Bill 21. A lot has happened over the last month and a half. Rural municipalities have been sort of uh, taken back from the news uh, releases that I've been seeing. In your own words, what did you think about these three bills when they first were presented? Well, I, I, I'll, I don't even want to be melodramatic. This is a tragedy in three acts. Um, the stark reality of, of, of what's been done is, is that the autonomy, uh, the authority, the, the, the great job that we do on behalf of all Albertans at the most localist levels has, has first of all, not been respected, has been degraded. And, uh, and we're really coming into an era of actually being a, in a bit of an abusive relationship. How, what's an abusive relationship? You isolate, Bill 18. You uh, basically threaten command and control, uh, Bill 20, and you actually assume that you're and, and you're degraded, which is Bill 21. Uh, no, no recognition of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, no understanding, um, and what we have are really uh, three acts that really I will I will say is a direct attack on rural Alberta autonomy. Here's the stark reality, Chris, is that right now population 85% is urban, 15% rural. You know the migration to Alberta. You know what's happening is that we're getting increased urbanization across the world. But let's talk specifically about Alberta, and maybe we can actually speak of the Prairie Provinces. The rural populations are going to be less than the urbans. We're going to see urban governments in the future. And this is really the last chance for us to actually be able to support the autonomy. Uh, because future governments, future elected municipal officials, not only by these three acts, but will ultimately be put into a smaller and smaller box and not be able to do the job that they're doing. And when we have a hyper urban future government, um, rural Albertans and rural elected officials will literally have no say, no voice, and this government has actually achieved that in three acts. And these three acts in many ways are actually, uh, at least Bill 18 and Bill 20 is an attack on Calgary and Edmonton, but the collateral damage is all the rural municipalities in the province of Alberta. Do you so, see it, do you mention urban, urban and rural, do you see a differential effect large versus small municipalities or rural versus urban municipalities? Well, I think the, the intent of this is, is to be responsive to straw bylaws and, and to, to maybe put the, the uh, um, put the urban, the, the larger metros on their heels. Um, this has not been thought through and I'll be extremely blunt. I do not believe uh, these three acts were written by uh, um, officials within these departments. I think these were written by constituency associations, they're written by some sort of advisors because they do not understand the unintended consequences. This is a terrible mistake, uh, the way these have been drafted and the way they've been put forward. The rationale is not there. Um, I like Minister McIver. I saw his press conference when I was coming back from Italy. Um, I don't even think he was convinced, to be quite honest. The evidence provided for some of the substance in Bill, uh, Bill 20 is not there. For example, uh, you know, you can't you can't use uh, uh, vouchering for someone or, or vetting someone, uh, voting machines. The, none of this is driven by any single complaint that has occurred from any of the members I've seen. There's no evidence for a majority of these things. This is actually creating bills that in many cases are gesturing on, on what really exists. The one thing I'll tell you is I've been around for a little while. I was elected in 2007. I've never had a prior government restate and overstate 
that we are children of the province. I've never heard it this much in my entire life than I have in the last two weeks. And you know what? We all knew it. And I've never had a government say it as many times as this government has said it in the last two weeks. Well, there has been a, some several comments made around consultation on all three of these bills, the first two in particular so far, with the, with the provincial, provincial government apparently suggesting that they have been doing some consultation on this and certainly would do some more in the amendment stage. What have you seen so far in terms of consultation and what are you perceiving might be coming down the road for that? Uh, well, if you include uh, media discussions of myself and, and concerns I have, if you call that consultation, then yeah, that's occurred. Uh, if you called uh, a couple of phone calls from a minister, if that's consultation, that's occurred. Uh, I define consultation a little more than that. Um, what issues do you have? We're going to the House. Is there some things we can do on election side and provide some clarity for, for future governments and, and future elections and municipal affairs? None of that's happened. Um, related to the federal, provincial, and municipal relationship, is there a way to make this better? That hasn't happened. Uh, as it will relates to emergency response, uh, we provided a fulsome report that provided some advice on communication, better use of resources. That hasn't happened. Bill 21 doesn't address any of those issues. So I don't know if consultation includes interviews like this and, uh, and radio interviews, then I guess I've been consulted. But for the most part, there's considerable errors and unintended consequences, all three of these acts. So I, I need to clarify something before I ask my question. So you're saying right here, right now, that you have not been contacted by McIver's office since he announced that there was going to be a consultation around Bill 20 and amendments to Bill 20 that were supposed to be tabled. And I'm looking at the calendar, knowing that we're recording this on May 17th, that were supposed to be tabled yesterday, May 16th. I, I've had discussions with Minister McIver okay. on proposed changes, uh, phone conversations, um, but have have we actually had a fulsome uh, engagement on Bill 18 and Bill 20 and Bill 21? We have not. Okay. So we are recording this one year since the last provincial election. And during that provincial election, RMA released their uniquely rural campaign that they were asking rural uh, residents from across Alberta to uh, ask their local elected leaders about potential rural issues. One of those was about this bylaw changes and you want it more consultation with the province and you wanted the province to stop making bills in Edmonton and start coming out to your local communities and actually making bylaws that would help or making acts that would help rural communities. Bill 20 seems to be an attack just on that, that part alone. Prior to the introduction of Bill 20 and this part of it, did you have any prior knowledge that this was coming down from the provincial government or were you blindsided like the majority of Alberta was? Listen, I had an amazing trip for three weeks with my wife in Italy. Uh, I was completely off grid. And uh, I said to my wife, hey, what's the worst that could happen while I'm gone? Bill 18 and Bill 20. So I had no indication uh, at the level and scope. Obviously, Bill 18 was talked about because for some reason, this government has Quebec envy. Very confusing. Uh, Bill 18, I'll get specific about Bill 18. Uh, you'll have to create another government department in order to manage uh, the Bill 18 provisions on the relationship. So you'll have to create a sub department because trust me, the volume will be high and the complexity will be there. At the same time, a government that's been hell bent on reducing red tape have created uh, red tape under that provision. Um, and the second part is, is that, that really what we were asking for, for the most part, was to be engaged. This is a conservative government. And my interpretation is con conservative government is small G government, local empowerment. That is literally the textbook example of a, this is not. This is big government, top down, centralization of authority. It's completely different than anything that we saw. It's different than the promises that were made. None of what that's come through these three bills were even discussed in the most at all uh, during campaigning. So fast forward to today, this came from nowhere. Uh, and well, this came from somewhere, but I don't think this came from the ministries, as I said earlier. So this is stuff that's being driven by constituency associations uh, based upon assumptions of conspiracies. Uh, it's pretty disappointing uh, because I don't think these have been thought out. Hey, you got rural Alberta mad. You know how hard it is for a conservative government to get rural Alberta mad? It's almost impossible. And my members, I've given them every opportunity and they said, Paul, you need to speak out. This is a direct attack on what we do, which is not easy, and nobody else wants the job. That's why we exist. And I've had members that are blue-blooded to you can never imagine, and they said, 
when do we give them the keys? They think they're so smart they can do the provincial job and our job, then here's the keys. Because that's literally what's being proposed. The other thing I'd say right now is you've actually empowered an unknown future government with a extremely big, big bat. And I've had this conversation with folks. So what we've been told time and time again, this isn't about you guys. We never use it on you. Trust us. Every single meeting with this government, they're going to have a baseball bat in their hand. And they're, and I'm, they're going to say, what's with the baseball bat? Oh, it's not for you. How can I work with a government that's got a baseball bat in their hand every time? When they convince me, they're like, oh, that's not for you at all. This is for someone else. What a ridiculous notion that they can hold that over us. And again, I'm probably going to hear next week that I'm a child of province. Uh, we're their responsibility. They know what's good for us. I'm on my fifth term. You know what? If I went around my municipality and I pretended I knew it was good for everybody, I wouldn't be past one term. If this government thinks they know everything, they don't. They need to be aware that they have Dunning-Kruger up the yin-yang. They don't know what they're doing as it relates to municipal politics. That's why we exist. So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate before I throw it back over to Ian for a second, because um, on my on my show, the crossboard interviews, I often ask the question, is there apathy when it comes to municipal issues? You're right. You're re- your members of RMA are probably upset about these bills. But when you go out to talk to residents of Pinoca County, when you go out and talk to oh, uh, uh, people up in St. Paul County, are you hearing from the app? And I say average resident, like the person who's not tuned into what's going on on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. And are you actually hearing that these bills are bad or are they just going over their heads and going, it's not my issue, so I'm not going to worry about it? I was in town yesterday, ran into one of the, the good old Bronx that live out here. <laughs> And he said, give them hell. From the a and Senate, from the coffee shops across rural Alberta, they are all talking about this. And they're like, why would you start taking away local government authority? Um, we're winning. And uh, to be quite honest, I'll guarantee you we're winning uh, in the public eye. Um, are we winning with this government? I think they're hell-bent on putting these through for reasons unknown to me, likely uh, some sort of review that's occurring in the fall, maybe, uh, for a certain subset. Uh, but what what they're re- not realizing is, is that the folks that I represent, um, they want to have, they respect and trust their local elected officials. Uh, we're government, but we don't act like it. And I think that they're underestimating, uh, quite honestly, um, the respect and the pull that we have. And I think what when they realize that, and they realize it the hard way, I don't sit there and cry and whine and throw things in the air for no reason at all. I'm telling you right now, this is a terrible mistake, a terrible mistake. And if you've thought this through, you would have come to us first. And when you first showed it to me, I'd say, this is a terrible mistake. And the problem is, is that I'm likely not going to have that voice, but I'm going to continue on the path that I'm on. Chris started off with a devil's advocate. I'm going to continue that way just a bit. Is there a case to be made for more provincial oversight in local government? Like in particular, in Alberta in particular, is it poorly enough behaved or not acting enough in deference of the provincial government? Well, well what what Bill a, what Bill Twenty should have done is first of all, uh, Bill Eighteen could have been addressed by by actually establishing a mechanism for MOUs and a relationship between municipalities approaching the federal government. Undeniably, municipalities have been played by the feds, and we got mom and dad are broken up, and they're not talking. And we got played in the middle. Undeniably, that's occurred. Some folks have bitten into that trap, and that's a mistake. Um, and municipalities have gotten outside their lane. So there's a case to be made, for sure, that stay in your freaking lane. I'll stay in my lane. You stay in your lane. We need to understand that municipalities that cross into health care or other joint responsibilities of the federal and provincial government should know better. Stay in your lane. And the conversation I have with Mr. McIver is that those provisions under Bill 18 as it relates to bylaws you should definitely quash bylaws that are not in the lane of municipalities, undeniable. Has Pinocchio County ever made a bylaw that's outside our lane? Not since the existence of Pinocchio County since 1952. Have they ever left their lane? So what's happened is, is that you've punished everyone by the acts of a few. And the other problem with all these pieces is, especially Bill 20 and Bill 21, these are reassertion of authorities that already exist with the province. What the province has said, oh, we already have these authorities, this is just providing clarity. It's doing the exact opposite. We do know you've got the ability to do this. You've showed it that you have the possibility. You've rescinded the, the mask bylaw in Edmonton. You've showed you have the authority at cabinet. 
You shouldn't make it easy. It should still be hard and municipalities should know better. The problem is, is that quite honestly, 90% of the municipalities will never leave their lane ever. We know what our job is. We know what we need to do and creating policy to punish very rare acts that definitely probably should be addressed uh, and dragging the rest of us down. As I said, it's an existential crisis for municipal authority because ultimately what you've done is you've used a massive hammer and destroyed, quite honestly, the autonomy and the ability of, of municipalities to do the job they do. If I have the government looming over me that I'm offside and them threatening me, it does not take very long for you to realize that probably a municipal affair uh, minister in the past or in the future could use this horrifically, horrifically. This is a monster of the future that we don't know, and it may be a monster in the past that we may know, but that's who could use this poorly, and this could destroy the relationship of municipalities. It could destroy rural Alberta, and it could really, actually, I'll be honest, it's how a provincial government could fall if misused. This uh, government and previous iterations of it have made some significant changes to local government structures. What I'm thinking about is there's a there was a recent requirement to add municipal development plans to even the very small municipalities and elsewhere in the country. Those would be known as official plans or official community plans. And when I think about some of these potential changes, do you think any of them would be a bit of a test for municipal viability to see if really the, the smaller municipalities that can actually do things like keep a voters list, uh, like if they can't do it, if they ought to be viable or not? Well, I mean, if you, if you, uh, you know, and, I, and someone said, you know, the fact is that, that I'm, I'm obviously in a very, very public dispute with this government. Right. And they said, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? They can take away my money and they can threaten to get rid of me and they can actually get rid of my bylaws. Oh, right. They did all those three things. I actually think that under LGFF, I believe the intent there is to bleed out municipalities, these small ones, is to actually push their viability button. Uh, putting a voter list and putting these other parameters, getting rid of, of, of the ability for municipalities to put more and more stress on them, this is a way to push those that are close to the edge over the edge. And I think it's the intent of this government uh, to start to actually start to have some consolidation by attrition. Uh, and this is just a continuance of all that. And it's not paranoia. Um, actually, if you go back to uh, the, the UCP, uh, some of their policy documents from the Kenny Times was actually, there was an intent there to decrease the number of municipal governments that exist in this province. That's since been pulled off the shelf, but the intent of the government is still there to actually decrease the number of municipalities, consolidate, amalgamate. Uh, they're never going to force amalgamation, but you can bleed a municipality out to, to cause a viability issue in the long run. And that's definitely going to happen. I want to turn to Bill 21 for a few seconds here because it is on a lot of people's minds with everything going on up in the rural municipality of Wood Buffalo, but also in peace country. We are seeing a little bit of rain, so hopefully that holds out and it does give some uh, help up to the uh, firefighters up there. Uh, RMA has call, said that this, if this bill passes, it would give the province sweeping authority to seize control over local emergencies, not only wildfires, but over also overland flooding flooding or any emergencies that are going on in the municipalities. That's a big claim to say, because I've read the bill, I've looked through the bill and it, it, it skirts the issue, but it doesn't say that they're going to come in and fully take over the emergency. They're just saying, you're going to tell us everything that the uh, emergency is going through. Um, what is your big issue with Bill 21 in your opinion? So Bill 21, quite simply, is, is there, those established incident responses are already in place. Um, those mechanisms exist. I had a fire last year. I triggered my incident response uh, plan. I up opened up my emergency operations center. I communicated with uh, Alberta Emergency Response. I've been highly trained. My entire council has been trained. Uh, we know how to respond to these incidences. Uh, these systems are in place. We work cooperatively with the province. Again, all these things exist. So I'm not actually sure what Bill 21 is. It's actually a watered down reiteration of what already exists. And so undeniably, when a situation becomes regional or out of hand, that transfer occurs. The communication as it relates to instances, that communication occurs. All the things that the minister has put in this bill, they occur. The one difference is, and if you actually read within Bill 21, it creates the unknown threshold of, you know what, we don't like what you're doing. And this isn't, we don't like how you're dealing with this, so we will take over. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the hold my beer approach to dealing with incidents does not work. It is a collaborative partnership using local knowledge and local skill 
in order to best take on a situation. If an incident's occurring in Pinocchio County, trust me, my team and myself know more about Pinocchio County than anybody in Edmonton. Any emergency responder anywhere else, every emergency response plan and incident command respects that local authority and local knowledge. Trust me, you need to know. Where can I get water? Who's got a D9 tat? I can get you 10 D12 tats. I can get you 15 operators. That needs to be recognized in the process. And instead, what this is, is really a political statement document saying, oh, we've got this. It's being used just as a mechanism. Now, the problem with all three bills that we're talking about is that, oh, don't worry about it. It's in regulation. Just to be clear how legislation works, as soon as these bills have royal assent, these authorities are transferred immediately to ministers or to departments. Regulations, a game that's played is all oh, the devil's in the details. That is not true. These authorities would transfer immediately. And so the, reg the regulation back in game, I'm not buying it. So going back to your original statement about how the municipality needs to stay in their lane, the municipality needs to stay in their lane when it comes to health, when it comes to education. Well, emergencies are traditionally in the realm of the provincial jurisdiction. Traditionally, municipalities deal with waste, water, sewer, roads, infrastructure. How can you say that you need to stay in your lane while saying that you can't take control over an emergency? Square that peg for me here for a second, Paul. For sure. So in the forest protection areas, in many cases, there's municipal uh, relationships by contract or otherwise to be the first response to an incident. Um, those relationships exist because we have the trained people, boots on the ground, we have the mechanism. Undeniably, in an escalating situation, that transfer authority occurs. Uh, we recognize the use of resources. And, and let's go back to last year. Um, rural municipalities across the province held the line for a considerable period of time before the province was able to allocate resources. And this year, I think, is the exception that they allocated resources early. But I'm still hearing that the allocation of resources has had a delay. And this isn't someone trying to create a turf and this is ours or not. Rec rest recognize that in rural parts of the province, we're the first to respond. We need to respect that. I'm not trying to take authority away. I'm not trying to assume someone else's authority. This is exactly what exists now. If the province wants us to completely step back and don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. You can't because the problem is, is that we haven't had a lightning strike fire situation. Last year, just be just to be sure, very few of those fires were lightning strikes. If we have a thunderstorm and the dry, even with this rain, we still have a very dry powder cake situation in our forest. If you have multiple fires occurring at one time, you bet your boots you want to have municipalities mobilized. Bet your boots you want us responding quickly using the existing resources we have. This isn't a turf game, it's not a fight. It's just this bill makes no sense. It makes no sense why it came forward other than as a political gesture that, oh, we got this. We're totally, you guys, the, the provinces, and that's sure, I guess. But the problem is, is that recognize the relationship, recognize the collaboration. We're there to work together. And this is just such a top-down centralization response. The other thing I'll tell you is that there's comments around instance response. Modern incident response is actually localized nodes as possible. You localize the authority of the nodes. That's the boots on the ground, the situation analysis. And the coordination at the upper lens is a resource conversation, not a situation analysis operation. The way Bill 21 is written is a centralized operation of issues. That is not what's, what's required in, in most situations in modern disasters in any way, shape, or form. And that's how you respond in most cases. That's how the response was last year. And that's how the response should be continuing in the future too as well. Across the country, well, because of the constitutional nature of local government in this country, uh, there's a slight differences from province to province and how local governments are structured. Are you hearing anything from colleagues across the country about what's going on and with these, well, the, at least the impact, potential impact of these three bills and kind of what would that response be from elsewhere? Well, I'm hearing them from everybody. They're thinking, geez, if, if Alberta can do this, Saskatchewan, we should do that too. That's not a bad idea. And New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And I don't know who's Ontario. I mean, I mean, what they could say is, wait a minute, you know, we can have a little bit more control. Kind of looks good. Um, so the problem with this is that the the ability to weaponize this is quite significant. And I think that you must realize that MLAs 
uh, likely would get lots of phone calls if, if a group in an area didn't like something and said, you know what, this council is offside, we need to get rid of this council. Um, that's going to happen. I'll tell you right now that will happen. You will get outcries of groups, and it may not actually be the community as a whole, but individuals. So that's what I think a lot of municipal leaders across Canada are really worried about, is that this becomes such a significant weapon held by the province that's not going to follow due process as it normally would. And they're very concerned about it. Bill 18 is, is definitely, I'm going to expect quite a few, quite a few jurisdictions are going to pick up Bill 18 because they're like, well, wait a minute, that's not a bad idea. You know, Quebec's doing it. We can have control. We can make sure we get all the glory because that's what everybody wants. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if those two definitely move through and some of the pieces tied to, to Bill 20 might get adopted by other provinces. So my colleagues across Canada uh, are worried and they probably should be worried because this really bad idea uh, could catch on in a lot of other places. What are you calling on the Smith government to do with these three bills? Overhaul them completely, cut them, destroy them, start from scratch? Is there anything that you are calling on the government today to do to these three bills to make your life a little bit easier heading into the May long weekend? Well, I think simply, and I'll do it in order, so Bill 18, quite simply, um, I think there needs to be an understanding that, hey, wait a minute, let's establish by virtue of MOU, let's establish a negotiating platform that allows us to actually work with the federal government, work with a the future federal governments, plural, um, and ensure that that relationship can exist. Uh, it'd be very complex and would provide some red, red tape. Um, I think if we can provide clarity on what that relationship could be, how we can actually advance those files together, I think that that's what Bill 18 should, should really have some provisions in there for exception to the rule, let's say. So we can actually, I can negotiate as, on behalf of Pinocchio County, I can negotiate with this government. I, that I want an MOU, that I have the ability to go and negotiate with federal departments on programs and then come back to the, to the provincial government. I think those provisions need to be built in. Bill 20, um, and I'm not going to say throw the baby out of the bathwater. In fact, verbatim, there's a few things in Bill 20 that we asked for, and they're actually quoted from RMA. So me actually saying to throw that all out is a ridiculous conversation. I think that what we need around Bill 18 and quite specific to the elimination of, of, of elected officials is that there needs to be uh, basically bookends around that. It needs to be contained and clearly stated in Bill 20 on when you would remove. The public interest is not defined. There's 36 to 40 different ways to interpret public interest uh, in Canada. And so public interest is the wrong word. So they need to have parameters. As it relates to bylaws, any municipality that actually has a bylaw that is out of the jurisdiction should be clearly put forward. There should be mechanisms around that and it needs to be contained. Um, and I think as it relates to Bill 21, there should be an emphasis in Bill 21 to in creating increasing collaborative agreements with municipalities. Bill 21 though is a reiteration that already exists. So again, I'm not even actually sure why Bill 21 exists. It probably can be salvaged in as much as it should just establish um, that the partnership that exists is now uh, should continue through the process and be respected by virtue of how we deal with instances in the future as well. Last fall at the RMA convention in Edmonton, Premier Smith got up on the stage and said that uh, this government and RMA are in a strong relationship because they support each other. Um, I'm going to ask a stupid question, but I think it's an important one to end on. How is your relationship with this government today, May 17th, as of recording? Well, I think our, our relationship is as good as they want it to be. Um, I, I don't believe that I actually own any of the issues. I'm having to respond to um, the unintended consequences of probably three bills that have not been properly thought out. And regretfully, um, I think that going forward, the problem we're going to have is, is that I, I expect that cabinet thought that consultation occurred on all three of these bills. That's my expectation, that they felt that we followed a process that we are typically committed to on these joint uh, matters of interest between both, both parties. And so the Smith government and, and all the ministries need to probably do some, and we're looking and say, wait a minute, what is your test? Did we actually, it doesn't mean we need to agree. You don't need to make it, make me happy at every time. I don't even ask for that. But I'll tell you right now, if something's a mistake and I'm telling you it's a mistake, um, my members are saying this is a mistake. I'm taking, hundreds of years of corporate knowledge telling you, I've been around for a long time. I've seen many, many premiers. If I'm telling you this is a bad idea, you should probably pay attention because I don't often say that's a bad idea. 
Very rarely do I use my pulpit to say this is a bad idea. And I'm telling you right now, this is a bad idea. Paul, I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for joining us today again on the political trenches. It's always a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. You betcha. Have an amazing long weekend. You too.